Yeah, that's yeah. far into the minor. Yeah. 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 Specialist. I'm joined today by my colleague Kelly Malmo Wilson, who is a neurokinetic therapist and body mapping. Um, Alexia Del Palazzo, who is a physical therapist. Okay. Hello, good morning. And Angela Vick Houston, who is a personal trainer. Um, we are all flutists, and we have a keen interest in helping flutists play better and feel better as, as they play and as they learn. So we do special attention for instrumentalists, not just list, um, making the craft better, making you feel better, staying healthy. So I'm going to start today with body mapping. Um, Lord knows. Um, I am from Boston, and I am on the faculty of the Longy School of Music of Bard College and the New England Conservatory. I teach body mapping at both of those schools every semester. We are very lucky. So body mapping grew out of the Alexander Technique. It is about understanding the body's anatomy so that we can organize our movements so that it is natural and fluid. 
which is what we want to put into our claim. Um, we look at basic anatomy, we compare what we think to the basic anatomy, anatomy and we find differences in how we're designed to move versus what we're using. So we refine that. So in body mapping, we train three areas, or three foundational areas to the method. We train the senses, we train attention, and we train movement. And this is the foundation to everything we do, because movement creates our sound, creates our technique, creates phrases, I mean, we could go on, it creates everything. So we train those three, and it prevents injury, or also helps heal injury, and it increases musicianship. So it's a really beautiful two-fold um, process. My students sometimes come because they're injured, sometimes they come because they feel stuck, and a whole new level of expression opens up. It's really wonderful. All right. So today, we are going to look at training awareness. Okay. We have a lot to pay attention to when we're on stage. When I ask that question, I also often get answers like, I've got to pay attention to my music, the rhythms, the notes, the dynamics. I've got to pay attention to my ensemble, to my conductor, to where my body is in space. There's a lot to pay attention to. And sometimes we get sucked into a very small awareness sphere. And that makes it hard to maybe feel how we're relating to the ground or how much pressure we're putting on the key. So with body mapping and with training attention, we learn to observe. We learn to observe movement as we're in the process of playing. We learn to recognize habits or movement patterns. For instance, sometimes when we're in the high register, we're squeezing keys too hard to try to get that sound out instead of using air. Lots of different things I could talk about. So we recognize these habits and we say, ah, I don't have to do it that way. Um, we can recognize habits by watching videos, um, that's a really great tool, using a mirror, that's the, those are the best ways I have found. All right, so we are going to start with training attention today. So in body mapping, we organize a quartet of music making senses. We, and we call this inclusive awareness. So inclusive awareness is where we are aware externally and internally. Our focus may be on one element of our awareness, but we don't lose sight of the other elements. So right now, I'm feeling my feet on the ground as I watch all of you. Um, I'm feeling my breath. I'm feeling, I'm seeing, I'm hearing sounds like the projector. So we're gonna go through the process of building this inclusive awareness. This is the very best for music making because what it does is it opens up the central nervous system in it, which allows us to move. And that's what we're doing on stage or in our practice. So I'd love to invite you all to stand. So this is a systematic way to build your awareness, and it's something you can do right on stage. You can do it right before you practice any section of your music. I, I do it repeatedly. Um, I do it before every movement, before every piece. Okay. So as you're standing there, I'd like you to notice that you can feel the ground underneath your feet. And just notice where you are. Are you more on one leg, or are you equal? If you are more in one leg, I'd invite you to come equally to both legs. And just notice how, where you can feel the weight in the floor, or the weight in your feet to the floor. And as you've been doing that, you've been listening to me, you've been hearing my instructions, and you've been paying attention to your feet. And you notice that you can do that simultaneously. So we're getting ready to play, or we're in the process of playing. The other thing you can feel, which is really helpful for musicians on stage, is feeling close. So notice that you can feel the weight in your feet on the floor, and you can feel your clothing. You can notice soft, scratchy, tight, loose movement. You can notice any of those things, and you can still feel your weight on the floor. And you hear my voice. So I'd also invite you to put the sound of the projector in your voice. That's an ambient noise. I'm always looking for ambient noises when I'm on stage. Um, it puts me in my space. And so you can hear that. We've got two senses going. And wait, you've been seeing me. So you've got three senses going. All right, we're going to come back to seeing in a minute. Um, and then the fourth sense is the kinesthetic sense, your sense of movement. So right now we're all breathing, I hope. Um, and you're going to feel your breath. You're going to feel movement of your ribs. So if you want, put a hand on your ribs and just notice that as you breathe, there's some movement there. So this gives you a little tactile awareness of the breath. Let that arm go. And notice that you can feel that breath not because you have a hand on it, but you can feel it using your kinesthetic sense. It is your sense of movement. 
at every joint in your body and, and almost every muscle, you have the ability to sense movement, tension, freedom, relaxation, whatever it is. So we've got three going. We've got tactile, floor, clothing. We've got auditory, my voice and my projector, and maybe some movement in the space, or there was a phone outside. And you've got that kinesthetic sense. So when we're nervous, what happens to vision? Does anybody have an experience that they can share? What happens to your vision when you're nervous? I get like tunnel vision. Get tunnel vision. So would everybody pick one point on that slide and would you get tunnel vision? Like your career depends on it. And notice what happened to your awareness of the floor, your breath, and the sound. It probably changed. Yes? Yeah. All right. So vision is like icing on the cake, in my opinion. Um, it always works. So what we want to do is we want to be able to see our focal point, but we also want to have a sense of the space around us. So we're going to use our right hand for this experiment. And what we're going to do is we're going to measure out our peripheral visual space. So you're going to take your right hand and make sure you have a, you should all be okay. Um, you're going to be looking at your focal point. It might, on stage, it might be the music, it might be the conductor. So pick something that is your focal point. And I want you to start to raise your hand out in front of you like this. And notice the first place that you can see it at the bottom. So you're going to start slow and start to raise it. And notice where's the first place you see it. You're going to see it at the corner of your eye and look down. That's, that's the bottom of your peripheral field. So as you look at your focal point again, take in that bottom of peripheral field. Your focal point will be in focus, but the, everything else will be a little blurry. So we're going to take that arm, we're going to continue up, and we're going to find the last point where you can see your hand up in the, above. And when you find that, look up. That's the top of your visual space, your peripheral region. So let your arm go down and look at your focal point. And I want you to notice that you can also see around that space, above and below. And you can feel the floor, and your breath, and your clothes. You can go on. So now we've got to measure the lateral part of the visual space. So you're going to take your hand out in front of you. Let's all use the right arm. And you're going to start to go out to the side. Where's the last place you can see that hand before it leaves your peripheral field? And when you get there, look out. That's the outside of your per peripheral vision. And let your arm drop. And notice that you can see all of that as you look at your focal point. So when my students are going on stage, when I'm going on stage, I find my first note. And then I open up that peripheral vision because it's getting me ready to move. If I'm in that narrow vision, tension comes into my body. So feel those feet on the ground again. Listen to the sounds, particularly the ambient noises. Pick your focal point. Maybe it's me. Maybe, but notice if you're looking at me, you can see beyond me too. I might be your focus. Feel the breath. What that nice. And let's pretend that you've got your flute in your hands. And would you pretend to deliver that suit up and just notice the quality of the movement of the arms? Is it different for anybody? I mean, I know we don't have a flute, but did you notice all of the motions that took place that were fluid and natural? So this is setting you up for your best playing. All right. So building inclusive awareness is a great way to deal with stress and fear. If anybody gets a little nervous on stage, Yep, I'm nervous. Oh, she's here. She makes me so nervous. But I say, okay, let me find my feet on the floor. Let me open up that visual field. You're still here, but I'm doing stuff that's going to make my music better. Okay. Um, it's going to help me move better. So what I invite you to do, do as the um, presentation goes on, I invite you to use your inclusive awareness as you listen to all of these presentations that we have coming today. It's going to help you learn better. It's going to be practice for bringing it into your plane. Okay? Have a seat. Thank you. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly, who is neuroplanet there. Um, I have been a body mapping teacher since 2007. I teach a course at Oberlin Conservatory. Uh, every semester now. Um, through teaching body mapping, I found that there was a small subset of my students that I wasn't reaching. We understand the information, 
but they could not get that into their body. And so after a while, I started to think that it was me, because I know these were smart kids, and they were working hard, and they're not getting it. And anyway, what I found was that I really needed a manual therapy tool to help sort out muscular imbalances that I could see and didn't have any way to address. So I went back to school at the age of 44 to become a massage therapist in order to become a neurokinetic therapist. So I am a massage therapist who doesn't massage. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. a year and a half of school for that. I am a neurokinetic therapist that uses uh, my background and knowledge as a massage therapist to do my muscular release work. So I know it's a little goofy. Uh, one of the very uh, most uh, beneficial parts of being on a panel like this or attending a panel is that you can get a little taste of a bunch of different modalities. I have found uh, through my own personal experience that everything works for somebody and nothing works for everybody. And all of these things are valid. And they're maybe more valid for you personally at certain times in your life, depending on what's going on. And so it's your job is to find the thing that speaks to you and works for you. And if you're the therapist and you're working with somebody and they're not getting any better, you need to be able to chuck your own ego and say, hey, you need to go see this friend of mine because what I'm doing, what I can help you with, is not working. So this is not the right thing for you. Look here, right? can refer you on to somebody else. Um, injury recovery requires team. Uh, in 2013, I suffered a potential career-ending injury to right here, the base of my index ring on my left hand. Kind of a big deal for flute players. <laughs> yeah, we need that. Um, my team of professionals to put me back together included the best hand therapist I could, hand surgeon I could find, who does Cleveland Browns and Cleveland Orchestra member hands. Um, I had multiple hand therapists. I had an Alexander Technique teacher. I had a Feldenkrais uh, awareness and movement teacher. I had an acupuncturist. I had a chiropractor. I had a naturopath physician. And I had all of my own knowledge as a body mapping teacher and my friends that I could call up and say, watch me play. What do you see that I'm not seeing? And, uh, most recently, I had a uh, lumbar back surgery in March of this year, and again, physical therapist, orthopedic surgeon, my NKT uh, mentor. So all of these things, you, you need that to get yourself healed from things. Um, strength training, I didn't go see a specific strength uh, trainer like Angela, because I've been doing that work since I was in high school myself, so I already knew um, how to do that. Okay, if you remember nothing else from my part of this, Pain is your body's request for change. If something hurts, it is your body saying, stop, we need to make a change here. This isn't working. This is not going to work long term. But when something hurts, what do we usually do? We ignore it. Like, oh, it'll get better. And we just keep blasting on until such a point that you can no longer function that way. So pain is your body's request for change. All right, so neurokinetic therapy, what is this? Anybody ever heard of this? <laughs> okay. um, it's relatively new, but not really. Uh, it's been on the scene for about 30 years, developed by a man named David Weinstock in Marin, California. Um, and here's the, here's the definition. The one, the one sentence definition is a system of manual therapy that uses specific muscle tests and soft tissue releases to engage the motor control center of the brain, rapidly restoring motion and resolving compensation patterns. Okay, yeah, that's great. What does that mean? Um, what that means is um, we can tell if muscles are working in an organized fashion or if they are not working together. If they're not working together, we can sort out why they're not working together and fix it. Um, example, if you're in a dysfunctional relationship, person A is doing all of the work, person B is doing nothing. Not good. What can we do to fix this? We can encourage person A to stop taking over and being so bossy and running the show. And we can encourage person B to get with the program and start contributing. And then we have a more balanced relationship. And so what we're doing with the MK2 protocol is that same thing. And we're looking at muscles. But we're not actually testing muscles. We're, we're testing movement. Okay, brains don't think in terms of isolated movements. Um, people who do dissection and cut things up into pieces, that's how it gets separated. Your brain doesn't think that way. Um, uh, with uh, muscle 
testing is used by a lot of professionals for different reasons. In massage therapy school, I learned muscle testing as a function of muscle strength. In NKT protocol, we don't care about muscle strength. If we want to know is can your brain find that muscle and fire it at the right time? So we're interested in the Wi-Fi connection speed, <laughs> not the size of the server or the fact that your phone is an iPhone 3 instead of an iPhone 10 or whatever number that we're up to now. Um, so we're all walking around with certain levels of dysfunction. Right? And we don't even know it until we get so dysfunctional that it hurts. How do we become dysfunctional? Well, it's because we are master compositors. That's why we can do all the things that we can do as humans. So if you think of an example, if you've ever, anybody ever had a leg injury where you've been in a walking boot? Okay. I, both of my daughters had these. So, so when you're standing, it's this kind of thing, right? You can't even stand level because the thing is too high. And when you're trying to walk, we do this kind of thingy. I'm really exaggerating. See this out to the side? <laughs> walking is because you can't swing through because you're total head. And so then, walking boots done, injury to kid still has a little bit of the same wonkiness. And then 10 years later, gee, I have all this hip and low back pain on this side. I don't know why. And so um, it's natural to kind of, um, if there's an injury, to, to contract around that injury. But what happens is that the compensation pattern doesn't go away after the body is healed. Okay, those are some of the things we can sort out with NKT. Many of my clients have been to strength training. They've been to PT. They've been to their doctor. They've done everything. They're better. They're not as good as they want to be. And so this, for many people, is the missing piece that it can get uh, everything back functionally the way people want that uh, for their movements. Um, an example for flute players. Anybody ever have that pain here? <laughs> OK, a very common pattern I find in uh, well, instrumentalists. Oh, I work with a lot of string players at my end, so a lot of bow arm issues here. Um, there's a relationship between your pectoralis minor muscle in the front, which um, I'm not going to get too super geeky with anatomy because you don't really need to care right now. Okay? It, what its job does is pull your shoulder blade forward. And in the back, there's another muscle, uh, your middle trapezius, that is supposed to pull your shoulder blade back. Okay? So, in many times, this one on the front is overworking, ah, really, really tight, and this one in the back is trying to work. And it can't because it's tugged in this forward position all the time. So it hurts back here, but the problem is here. So you walk around massaging here. But gee, it feels better. And as soon as I stop massaging, it hurts again. Because that's not where the problem is. The problem is here. And you release this, and then that can function normally. So this is kind of a symptom of that. So another thing you find a lot in NKT is where the pain is, is not where the problem is. Um, NKT does not lend itself to group experimenting <laughs> because it's very individual. So I'm going to go to uh, massage therapy, which is absolutely something you can do for yourself. Anybody ever been told that you have jaw tension, tongue tension, TMJ issue? Okay. All right. For this purpose of what we're going to do here, you need to be your own movement police. If something you're doing hurts, stop. Okay. So I'd like you to clench your teeth. Yes. Okay, then try just staying on the side that's really hard. The okay, muscle is called massacre. Okay, just stop doing that. And what happens? Hey, your mouth is open. Right? Okay, so this muscle goes from cheekbone to bottom of your jaw. And what I want you to do is gently, using two fingers, you have two choices. You can look for sore spots in that muscle. Okay? Sometimes they hang out down here on the bottom. Sometimes they're on top. Sometimes they're in the back. Punch around, and you find one. Two choices. You can put pressure right into it and just hold until you feel something let go. That's a trigger point release. Right? You can go back and forth over the spot. So if the muscle goes the long way, you go back and forth sideways. <laughs> See if you can release some stuff in there. You don't have to do sound effects unless you <laughs> like that. <laughs> right? You may find lots of them in the back. Um, for those of you that are feeling great, don't do it right now because you can't wash your hands. You can do this with a finger in your mouth and your thumb on the outside. So you can squeeze on uh, there. Okay, don't do it right now without washing your hands. Yeah. Okay, stop doing that for a little bit. Open your mouth if anything's not in there. 
Okay. Do you have these with you all the time? Can you do this all the time? Yes. Okay. Here's another one. Um, this is a machine technique uh, category of things called uh, TechAltNet, which is professional technique. Now, I can't see you all. I just took off my glasses. If you're having, if you wear glasses, you may need to watch what I'm doing, then take it off so that you don't mess up your own glasses. Uh, with your either middle finger, finger or index finger, I want you to tap mm -hmm. right on the inside edge of your eyebrow. Maybe about eight times. Tap, tap, tap. tap. Kind of fairly hard. I mean, don't whack yourself on the head like you're trying to knock yourself off. Oh, just tapping. Okay. Tap over to the outside edge of your eyebrow and tap about eight times there. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yes, you're doing exactly in rhythm with me, which is awesome. Because with normal people, they are just like this. <laughs> so come down here to, if you could look directly underneath your eyeball, like down, right on your cheekbone, tap there. And if you've got anybody has sinus stuff going on, this might be really uncomfortable. And then go in a little bit more towards your nose. Okay. Okay. I'm going fast because I've got 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, go down to this little gap under your nose, under, between your top lip. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then you can go around your mouth <laughs> to the nail on your chin right here. Tap, 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 tap. Okay, now just sit here for a minute. Does your face feel different? Does your face feel like <laughs> kind of droopy? Okay, how long did that take? Well, 37 seconds. <laughs> okay, can you do that a lot? Yes. Okay, uh, what would be cool is if you did it before and after with your uh, booty flute. That that's the whole thing you're going off. I'm going to go over one more slide and then I will be. Um, it's not letting me pause. Okay, all right, that's right. Somebody else can do that. Um, flute modification. Um, I used to be a purist and then I didn't want junk on my flute. After you have hand surgery, you'll have anything put on your flute that can possibly help you be able to play on that instrument again. Um, these are pictures of my Frankenstein flute. Um, I could probably do a whole session on weird stuff to stick on flutes. Does it help? And I need to cite as my source with this Alexis Dill, who is at Oberlin and very, very generous with her time in helping to build stuff for me and a lot of people. Um, if you need key height, um, you can put stuff on keys to make them taller. You can cut little pieces of wine cork and stick it on there with masking tape. You can get those little saxophone pearly keys from the instrument repair shop. Stick them on there. You can get custom stuff done that's permanent to your keys. Um, this thing on the side, I need a little squishy here. That's a new thing. It's called uh, flute gel. Uh, they have them in the exhibit hall, except that I, we just bought them all. <laughs> <laughs> There are only two of them that you find. I think that Carolyn Miss Bob still has some. Um, you can order them. Um, this thingy, uh, you can also use a little case pencil grip that you cut it the long way and stick it on there. Um, my pencil grip fell off into my coffee cup when I was teaching in middle school. Yeah. And it was gross. And I had to put it back on there. Like, okay, we need something that's going to stay better. So that's what that thing is. Um, I had a, an angled P cluster on my. Uh, so joint, so I figured, why not? I messed up everything else on this instrument. Why not make that fit my hands better? And then on the right hand, uh, this is a little cork thingy that Alexis still built for me. I have one on my alto too that sticks out and makes a flat spot for your a flat spot on a round tube so that you can put more weight here when this part is compromised. Mm -hmm. I can probably play without them now. I keep them on there. Um, I have this flute here. I have other stuff if you want to look at it. Um, and a, a big fan of that, if you can modify it to make it easier, do it. Okay? Just be glad you're not a singer because they can't modify anything because it's inside. I mean, all the rest of us, you can do stuff with the instrument to make it uh, fit better in your hands. And very last thing, if you're buying a new open hole flute, um, the, I didn't know this until after my surgery, but all of the open holes aren't the same diameter. Uh, certain manufacturers have bigger openings than others. And if you've got little itty bitty fingers, you probably, I probably shouldn't have picked the one that has the biggest size, <laughs> but I didn't know. Anyway, okay, so there's the end of my thing. Going on to uh, Alexis. Oh, probably if you want to take a picture of the slide that has all of my content info on it. Um, there's also, we have the, yeah, it has it at the end to, uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> we'll get the questions at the end, okay? Thank you. Okay. Right, cool.
from the University of Oklahoma. Um, in between being a flute major and going to PT school, I was freelancing but also working day jobs. I had two realizations. One, I knew that if I didn't make a change, I would be working a day job forever. I didn't want to be changed to a desk. I wanted to be do, do something every day that I felt fulfilled doing and not just have to use it on the side. So initially I thought, okay, I'll go get a master's degree in music. So in the process of preparing for that, I injured myself. And it was a reoccurrence of an injury that I had originally in college. And it was it was tennis elbow. So I was beginning to do movement and how my movement impacted my performances. So I came and found Endeavor Educators and I started studying body mapping. But I felt like there was something more. I felt like something was missing for me and thinking long term that I wanted to be doing something more. So when I injured my arm, I asked for a referral to PT and the rest is kind of history. So I saw what they did. I liked what they did. So I looked it up, like, how do you become a PT? Found that out. I'm like, I can do this. So from inception of the idea that I had to become a PT to now has taken seven years. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm actually going to cry. Yes, I, I passed, so I'm officially a licensed PT as of August 1st in the state of Pennsylvania. And now I'm back to include things. <laughs> so I'm very happy to be here today um, with Amy Leichhardt with the presentation together. Um, I knew that I was coming to the end of schooling and I was excited to, to be able to jump back in and talk about physical therapy within the context of this great panel, this great idea. And right now I'm working as a staff PT in an outpatient private practice clinic in Westchester, Pennsylvania which is about a half hour outside of Philadelphia. So how many of you, show of hands, have been to PT for any reason? And then keep your hands up. Has it been for a plan related issue? Okay. So about 50-50. So my goal as a physical therapist when I decided to do this is to create a practice that specifically addresses the unique needs of musicians. When I injured my arm, I actually, I was living in central Pennsylvania at the time. I drove all the way to DC to find a PT who had a musical background to evaluate me first. Because I didn't know that just going to regular PT off the street, I didn't think they would help me to be honest. So I wanted that background. I wanted someone who understood what musicians deal with to better come up with a treatment plan that I could take back to my local PT and say, this is what she said, can we work on these things? So this is, in a nutshell, what PT does. We address limitations in movement. So we look at what are you limited in? So if you're coming to see me for a playing related injury, we look at the specific components that you have difficulty with that increase the pain when you play. Then we break that down and we figure out what the cause of that dysfunction is. You know, what, how are you moving? What's causing you to have the pain? What set you up for the injury? We have a very strong foundational science background as well as clinical science background. So it took me two years to take my prerequisites to get into school. Um, so I had to take chemistry, physics, biology. And then I got into school and then I started that process again of taking gross anatomy, 
um, kinesiology, biomechanics, and continued on in that process to develop as a, as a PT and to get that PT mindset. And I have so many interests that PT kind of fit all that. So I was interested in, like I had my music piece, but I was also interested in movement and neurology and, and so much. So the beauty of PT is it's a broad field. Okay, so right now I'm working mostly in orthopedic private practice, um, but we also see PTs working with neurologic population as well. And you can find PTs in a wide number of settings. How many of you know that you can see a PT without a prescription from your doctor? Yeah. So, depending on the state, we have some form of direct access in, in every state in the country, thanks to the legislative efforts of the APTA, which is the professional organization. Um, within Pennsylvania, you can get a direct access provision added to your license. So since I'm just newly licensed, it will take two years for me to add direct access to my license. So if you come see me in PA, you do have to have a script. Um, the best website to get information on how to find a PT and to start making phone calls to see if the PT can see you directly without that referral is MoveForwardPT.com. That is a consumer website that's maintained by the American Physical Therapy Association, and it's a great resource and has lots of lots of information. And since I'm a PT and I did all the science stuff, I did want to throw a little bit of research in. So I know anecdotally we cover and we know whether it's ourselves or we know someone else that has had plane related pain or plane related injury. But the research doesn't really show that. Um, there's a lot of research coming out of Australia. So in 2015, uh, two researchers completed a systematic review, so they went and saw, tried to find what evidence is there to support prevalence, like how, how big is this issue. And they really didn't find a lot because the evidence is just not there yet. Um, and it ranged from 15 to 95 percent for symptoms of any duration of time. So we need better evidence to show that, yes, Performing arts medicine, there's a real need for that, and we need more people plugged into that, especially people who understand the unique needs of musicians. So in my very limited clinical experience in the clinic today, I've been there for two months, um, I have treated, and these were not musicians, but I've treated a couple pieces of tennis elbow, um, which is what I, what I had. Um, and I've also treated um, a few shoulder impingement injuries. And with those impingements, what I noticed, and it touches on what Kelly was speaking to as well, is I'll see a forward head posture. Okay? And what I mean by that is um, we see it a lot in blue plane as well. And I kind of call it, my analogy is turtleneck. So your head's not balanced over your shoulders in a neutral position. But instead, you're either standing, the head comes forward, or if it only comes out when you're playing, you bring the flute up and you go to the flute, you don't bring the flute to you. Over time, that repetitive overuse and compensation can either lead to neck pain, shoulder pain, etc. So physical therapy can address these things. So a typical treatment will focus on maximizing your function, getting you back to what you want to do. We come up with your goals together, and we work on those things. So physical therapy is a lot more than just doing exercises. So when I assess my client, I'm looking at strength. I'm looking at how well they move, their quality of movement when they do things. Um, looking at how well they're able to sequence movements. So are they compensating in any way? 
So as part of their treatment plan, we'll do exercise. But when we're doing exercises, I also have my neuro cap on, and I'm looking at motor control, making sure that they can activate the correct muscles to achieve the movement and do it well. And then I even incorporate a little bit of body mapping into what I do, because um, I, have, I have that background, and I'm working towards my, my Andover Educator licensure as well. Um, so I see, how do they think they're moving? Does it align with how they are? And then we talk about that and together replace that movement with a more efficient quality movement. <clears throat> so the key point here and what we're all trying to stress to you today is the importance of having a wellness team. Each of us alone can help you, but I think we're stronger when we have a team and we have that ability to network and send people to what fits them and what benefits them. One of the limitations of PT is I only have so much time with you. It's not a continuous relationship. You can come back and see me time to time as you need, um, but insurance dictates a lot of what physical therapy can, pro can provide, which is a frustrating piece of that. But if you came to see me for PT, I would refer you on what I think you would benefit from, whether it's continuing and finding an Alexander Technique teacher, working with a body mapping instructor, going to Feldenkrais classes, or even continuing with a personal trainer. All of those aspects on maintaining wellness and health as a musician are really important pieces to maintain a long playing career. So my exercise, um, going back to the idea of forward head posture, if you have neck pain, if you have shoulder pain, you can look at just doing some exercises as a warm up prior to playing. The one I like here, that I think is just an easy take home, is just scapular retractions, okay? So just everyone, you can stay seated for this, but just come forward to the edge of your chair. Just have you bend your arms at your sides, okay? And then I want you to just bring your shoulder blades together, pinching them back. And we're activating the rhomboids here, which is a muscle that runs from the shoulder blade and connects to the spine, okay? And just release. So when you do this exercise, bring your shoulder blades back together, hold for three seconds, and release. That activates that muscle and gets you set up in a much more dynamic posture to prepare to play. And I would recommend doing this 10 times, just as a little set of exercise, just to prepare those shoulders to stabilize in preparation for play. Okay. My contact information is at the end, and again, we'll take questions at the end as well. And now I'll turn it over to Angela McKiston. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I want to say thank you all for coming. I hope you really gained some great stuff out of this presentation. And I really want to reiterate the whole team aspect. I'm really excited to be part of this panel because all four of us do something different that all works well together. And it all depends on you, what's going to work best for you. So yeah, this is all the stuff about me and we're, you know, fruit salad and all the letters and stuff. Basically, um, I got my master's in music performance from Florida State. And after that, I was like, well, great, now what? <laughs> uh, I always liked fitness, let's just yeah, discover that. And so, you know, I'd taken Alexander Technique classes, and I'd done body mapping classes, and I'd taken, does anybody know uh, Ava Omsler over at Florida State and her dynamic integration classes? And I was just, I knew I wanted to do something with the body, but I wasn't sure what. So I graduated and thought, well, you know, I like teaching, and I like fitness. Let's just check out this personal trainer thing and see if it's, what I want to do. And I found NASM is the National Academy of Sports Medicine, not schools of music. A little different. But they do actually, everybody uh, who is certified through NASM does a movement assessment. So they are a great resource if you're looking for a personal trainer. They're one of the, I settled on them because they deal with musicians really well because they're, they're going to find out where your individual muscle compensations are. And if you look for somebody with a CES, that stands for Corrective Exercise Specialist, 
they're going to do a more comprehensive movement, assess um, movement assessment. Uh, the CES is a corrected exercise, SFS, senior fitness, and the last one is I uh, recently got a cancer fitness certification. So how I got into it, I got injured a lot, and I didn't have anybody to turn to, and I really got tired of hearing, you should probably just stop playing, then it won't hurt anymore. That is not an option. Why are doctors constantly saying, just quit playing? I'm oh, sorry, why don't you quit being a doctor? That's just not, <laughs> that's not your answer. Does your job cause you stress? Just quit. Like, that doesn't work. So I had my first uh, first instance as a high schooler. Uh, went to Interlochen, loved it. But I went from big fish in the small pond to small fish in the big pond. I went from an hour to a day to eight hours a day. And that was back in like 97. You know, there was there wasn't a whole lot there about preventing overuse injury. It was kind of this term that floated around that affected older people. Uh, no, so I actually wore a brace the rest of it and uh, had a massage therapist find a big old knot, as she called it back then, right in here. And it just, it was like the size of my arm. It was huge. <laughs> so I'm playing so much. And then I, you know, when I got home, I couldn't hold a pencil without pain. I thought, this is, this is not cool. So then I actually tore my rhomboid while I was in graduate school in the gym, thought I was doing great, doing this motion, dumbest thing I could have done, didn't know good form, tore my rhomboid. The reason that's, that happened, besides the bad form, uh, it, there's a muscle compensation, as Kelly was talking about. These muscles are over tight. From doing 20 years of this, you think I needed to strengthen that a little more? <laughs> no. So <laughs> I found out the hard way is bad move. Uh, and then the third one, I was cramming for an audition. I found out the President's Zone was having a piccolo audition, and piccolo is my love. And I went, I've never actually studied the rep. I've got a lot of work to do. And that was a terrible idea. And so by the end of those few, I went from zero to 100. You know how that goes. And I was like, it's a short time. I can handle this. No, I can't. Your body can only let you do so much. And I went to see a doctor. You know, I couldn't put my arm down. I had muscle spasms in my back. And he said, <laughs> I quote, well, you've got a big knot over your heart. I could usually give you a cortisone shot right in the middle of it, but it's over your heart and that would kill you. So you probably don't want that. And I thought, <laughs> this is your answer? He goes, well, you should stop playing. He's like, that is not, I mean, that's right, I have an audition. He goes, well, put this cream on it and then rest when you're dying. <laughs> okay, I quit. I'm gonna find some way for me to be an answer. This is enough. So I found NASM and it's just been the best thing. So this is a good one. I've heard this before, I don't want to go in the gym, I'll hurt my fingers, I'll hurt this, that, and the other. There's a, there's a little bit of truth to that. Isn't there a little bit of truth that's dangerous to drive a car? It's kind of dangerous to be alive. So, <laughs> <laughs> when you put it that way. So, the thing with strength training is, you have to know what good form is, and you never want to lift with bad form. And if you don't know what good form is, don't lift, find out what that is. We'll cover that real quick. Um, these are the basics when it comes to strength training. You have to find what's tight and you let that go. As she was talking about, those muscle compensations. We stretch what's tight, we strengthen what's weak, and then you have to integrate it. And so uh, personal training actually works really well with PT because they do, they do a, a, what she was saying, she's gonna find those muscle compensations for you and really get that, that plus neuromuscular education. I just, I love that. And I love how body mapping goes right into all of that. It increases that awareness. Strength training really works well to integrate as a whole. Will the video work? Does work? Click on. Click. Can you hear this? This is not what it is. This is not. <laughs> okay, so Facebook found me. That is not what personal training for musicians is, and that drives me nuts. And that's what they, I'm like, you don't do sit ups and you play the flute. And they're like, can you run and play? Like, you don't do that. And like, oh, it's funny. Okay, so that's floating around on Facebook and on billboards and stuff right now, which is kind of awesome and kind of not. So, so anyway, that is not, if you're thinking that's fitness training for musicians, that's not what I do, okay? So, 
Um, this is the corrective exercise continuum. So if you see a CES, this is kind of how we operate. You inhibit, lengthen, activate, integrate. And the long story short of that is basically kind of, if you're thinking of what we are talking about with the chest, you're going to find what's weak, or I'm sorry, you're going to find what's tight and release it. You're going to find what's weak and strengthen it. And then you're going to integrate that into the entire thing. Into your, because the body does not work in sections. It works as a whole. You have movement systems. It's not, even if you're just doing a bicep curl, this has to, this is on the opposite side, your tricep. It, it, it lengthens the arm. And then your, your shoulder girdle, it, it, you know, I mean, it all works together. So, some common problems among flutists. Any of these look familiar? So we have that painful spot here, we have pain in our neck. We have a lot of pain <laughs> everywhere. I see a lot of asymmetrical, asymmetrical stuff. We have between the left and the right side. All my stuff has been on the left side for sure. Because we, if, if you guys put your hand up like you're playing the flute and we go to the, we go to the right, this feels kind of normal after so, so long, right? Do this doesn't feel right. Do you notice other things feel kind of tight that you would have never noticed, but you do this and it feels normal? So you've been doing it for so long. Right, so we have that imbalance from left to right as well. So I uh, just, I, I'm a faculty at Stetson University for their, their flute workshop every summer. And this just happened uh, three weeks ago. I asked, I did an advanced master class and I asked the kids, do you have playing related pain? And these are all kids who do. Like, they're high schoolers. Like, well, where does it hurt? Any of those look like your points? <laughs> yeah. So it starts young. It starts young, unfortunately. So if you, the, the quicker you can kind of catch things, as she was saying, pain is an indication that something is wrong and you need to make a change. These kids are already doing that. So I really wanted to have a little pointer here, but do you see some things here on the side? You see this business, this business, and they don't know they're being filmed. They don't know, you know, I showed it to them afterwards and they're, oh my gosh. Yeah, but we get wrapped up in our headspace when we play. And we're not paying as close of attention to the rest of our bodies, which can make those movement compensations really exacerbate those. So, more statistics of playing related pain, like she was saying, there have not been a lot of, uh, there have not been a lot of studies done. Thankfully, that is increasing. One of the last ones that I found is that, if you look at the bottom one, a 12-month period, the prevalence of musculoskeletal complaints in professional musicians ranged from 41 to 93 percent. That's, that's like everybody, It's kind of what it sounds like, right? So, I mean, if I ask you, have you been in pain, probably 93 percent of you are going to go, yeah, it had something. Okay. Um, okay, so these are more statistics, but can strength training help? And there, there have actually started to be some studies done on how strength training can help, whether it's isometrics or a systemized approach or a periodized progressive plan. All those things have been done. So there's been a 10-week exercise program that was made available to full-time musicians, and they thought it was great. They loved it. They got, let's see, rated to be moderately to highly effective for three performance-related factors, strengthening the muscles that support playing, learning techniques that support playing, and posture. So um, this, is, this is something that I would do if we had time, which we don't, but I have some things up here if you want to come talk to me afterwards. If we were going to do a session and you came to me with playing-related pain in this area, this might be what I would do. Everybody is a little different, but this is what I see most often. So we might use a lacrosse ball because a, a personal trainer is not allowed to put hands on a person, okay? So unless you have a license or an athletic trainer, you have, if you're not licensed, a trainer cannot do that, just FYI. So the way we get around that is that we can help you use self-myofascial release, which is either a lacrosse ball or a foam roller or any of those things, and we're looking for those tight points where we can help release, kind of what you just did here, okay? So we release them, and then we stretch them, and then you put yourself through a full range of motion. So the way I kind of like to think about it is your brain right now thinks your muscle is this long. When you release it, it still thinks it's that long, even after you stretch it. So when you put it through a dynamic range of motion, it's a neuromuscular education that, oh, my muscle is actually this long. It's a generic way to think about it. But, um, and then you have to activate those weak muscles. Now that we stretch them out, let's activate them and then let's put it into a full range of motion. So chest stretch, we were going to do this. I don't know if we can really 
this, this is one of my clients. She's a violinist, and she agreed to be, I'm writing a book, and she agreed to be my model, so I think she does a really good nice job. <laughs> For a chest stretch, what I'm going to tell you to do, and again, like they said, if it hurts, don't do it. Don't do it. Everybody is different, and what works for one person might not be appropriate for another, okay? So if you're in a doorway, you go about 90 degrees, you, that, that scapular retraction she was talking about, you squeeze that shoulder blade back and down, and then you twist away, okay? And you can control that level of stretch. You don't want to go really far. You don't want to bounce. Any of that? Please hold. And if you want to go up a little higher, that's going to hit pec minor down here, which is a, oh, nice. It's a really, it's a nice, um, a nice little guy that, that gets pinched a lot and causes more of that humeral dumping that we see. Do you do that just on one side? You try it on both, and if it feels tight, do it. Okay? And so this, these are the thoracic rotations. And if you'd like these slides, I'm happy to send them to you. Okay? So that would be your dynamic movement. The activation, you're going to go this way. It's a, again, it's just a, a, a more, a way to, uh, Activate those rhomboids and middle traps she was talking about. A little more weight, just using your arms, okay? Prone wise gets the lower traps, which this you can do all day. It's not hard. The hard part is when you squeeze your shoulders down and try to pull up. That's the hard part. You should feel that right in the middle of your back, okay? So to integrate, we would do a row, and you can do them standing or seated. Oops, anyway. So that would be like an example of how we would do that, okay? Here are your references if you need them and how to find them. If you need that. And I'm, I'm going to be at the Performance Health Committee booth uh, the rest of the day. If you need me. And that's all our contact information. Thank you guys so much for coming. We have seven minutes. So we can yeah. take questions. Okay. Yeah. First question was really nice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have oh, a yeah, I, so what exactly is the tapping supposed to do? Is it supposed to release muscles or what? Yes, 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 okay. yes, yes, all of that. Um, yeah, I'm just going to give you that answer, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really long one, and um, um, there, there's stuff that happens when you, when you have this contact with the okay. vibration. It's, it, Thank you. <laughs> I would say it also creates awareness. Like you'll be able to feel that tissue more. Okay. Other questions? Um, so I was going to talk to you after, but I'm doing a BM um, on a PT track right now for Fluke. And I was just, at, I would get that when we have like a performing arts like, PT clinic. Yeah. And I was just wondering if you've like seen that in any other places in the country too. I just like super cool to have it like we'll have a group of um, the older students will diagnose them. But Shenandoah in Winchester, Virginia has a, a PT, or performing arts PT track. Um, a lot of the times, most of the performing arts dancers have taken that over. Yes. So I'm trying to change that a little bit and getting more involved with my professional organization. And I'll be joining the orthopedic section. So there is a performing arts special interest group as part of our professional organization. Um, but it's still pretty limited. And what I find is there's PTs working in isolation across the country that have a performing arts focus, but we're not really working together yet. And there are also um, universities that have musician wellness teams on campus. Uh, Michigan, Virginia College, Michigan State, Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins, UNLV has one. Three places you have one. Oh, uh, UNT has a uh, oh, performance yes. as well. Yeah, yeah. I think it is. Yeah. Um, I live in California. I thought you were like a therapist. You gave me the name of a person who uh, is in Marin. Is it the same person who wrote the book? Yes, right? Okay, sure. Can you tell me his name? Yes, that would be good. And also, is it? I, I've been to a PT person in Berkeley, California. And um, I think it's a very good PT person. And I've been to a PT person in Berkeley, California. And I think it's a very good PT person. Didn't seem to know much about, a very nice person, did not seem to know much about osteoporosis. I have full scale osteoporosis in my lumbar spine. It scares me to death because I, I say, I say, what should I do? And I say, don't fall. It's fine. <laughs> 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 bicycles. I, I, I gave up on my bicycle. Really sad. I gave up. 
cross country skiing, but that was all right. That was easy. <laughs> and uh, a lot, there, there's sort of a disconnect there for me with, I, you know, the people know a lot about osteoporosis, but they, they don't, they're not musicians. And, you know, like you said, there's a team. Okay. <laughs> But it needs to be California. Well, there is a great program in Feldman Christ. It's called Bones for Life. It's bone building through um, force, and that's fantastic. I said that, that, that like both Feldman's? I didn't really I don't know that one. Bones for Life is a Feldman Christ. Bones for yeah. Life. Yeah. I have a question that's related to this. Um, I'm going to a physical therapist for a shoulder impingement, and I don't know if it's because I'm trying to do weight classes because I also have osteoporosis. But I also play the flute a lot and have neck pain and, and shoulder pain. Yes. And so do you do you not do anything in between the, the PT sessions? Like, you know, she gave me exercise to do, plus I'm going to my exercise classes and not using weight on the right side. I'm just trying, I don't want to stop exercising because I'm not taking any drugs right now for the osteoporosis. And I, it's like I feel like I have... One more year before my next sex exam, and did I get worse or did I get better? So, do, what could I be overdoing in general? Like, I went swimming here, and now I feel like my arm hurts more. And and I did swim hard. I was just doing a breaststroke. You know, like, I, what do you say? Don't do it. Singer. No. So the thing to emphasize is that you should keep moving. The key is to not do it, not overdo things so much that you wind up with pain. Or soreness that persists too long. So if you're weightlifting, you're swimming, and would you describe your pain more as soreness or achiness? Achy, okay. But after I practice, I feel locked. Like if I, I finish practicing, then it's like, oh, to turn my head, I, you know, I, and I, they say stretch before, but I can't see Do you take break. breaks while you're practicing? Um, usually just to, to, to release my neck, you know, but no, I don't take all right, how about actually physically putting a flute down, taking a break? Yeah. 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 I teach a lot of movement as I'm practicing, so I might be doing spinal flexion or spinal extension. I might I'd be doing rotation. I use all of that long play. I'm never just looking at my stand. So that's that's one idea. I have some videos if you want. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if any of you have um, any expertise on hypermobility. I do. Yeah. I am hyper. So maybe uh, you're hyper. Yes. yes. So I unfortunately might, um, talk to you after. Please do. Please do. Well, we want to thank you all for coming. We are here. Our contact information there. Feel free to reach out, even if you don't live in Boston or Nashville or Philadelphia or Ohio. Reach out. We have contacts all over the place, and we can also do online training. Thank you. And the flute is up here if anybody wants to see the I'm going to find those. 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 I'm going
And then they go down to the And then as you're playing, what might set a time for you?